little song I wrote in all these songs I wrote on the road. You know that, don't you? Once upon a quite a while ago, I, with the usual cocksure hipster swagger that once I so effortlessly and unthinkingly mustered, said there were three great American songwriters no one had ever heard of. John Prine, who was in fact quite well known and went on to become very much better known, Amy Rigby and John Hyatt. Well, Prine I have done and Amy's for another day soon. For today, it is John Hyatt's time. My hyperbole aside, Hyatt is one of the classic American songwriters working today, with a body of work that shows all of the spotty flaws of his youthful inexperience in his nonage and all of the tanned hide of hard life lessons in his dotage, and that his dedicated cult of fans wait eagerly for each increasingly infrequent expansion upon. Tolkien told us once that not all who wander are lost. Hyatt fits the classical model of the wanderer first from style to style, voice to voice and label to label when he was lost, but once he found his purpose, his motivation, he kept moving, but this time with a reason, knowing always what and where home was, but roaming to pleasure in various musical harbours just to add colour to the view of the stories he told. Hyde was born into a working-class family in Indianapolis in 1952. Growing up in a house on the corner of 57th Street and Central Avenue, one of eight children, he dug Bob Dylan and the Stones. Home life was rocky. His dad, whom he loved dearly, and his mother couldn't get along. His real idol, though, was his cool older brother Mike, who took over the family business when Dad got ill. Double tragedy struck, though, when Mike took his own life when Hyatt was nine, and his dad died two years later. His relationship with his father and the spectre of suicide were recurring themes in his later songs. At his dad's death, he took up guitar and was soon playing in local bands. He also developed a lifelong love for indie car racing, another theme that later came up in songs. He left home at 18, heading to Nashville in a Chevy Corvair he bought for $35, where he almost immediately scored a staff writing job at a publishing house for $25 a week. He provided songs for hit makers such as Conway Twitty and Three Dog Night. In 1973, he wrangled a record deal with Epic Records, the first of seven labels he'd bounce about on. Hits were slow in coming, though, and matters were made no better when Hyatt lost his contract with Epic and then his songwriting gig. He and his wife relocated to Los Angeles, and after being dropped by MCA after two albums, which did well critically, Critically, but sales were nugatory. Tragically, they began to slide into a pit of alcohol and hard drug abuse. Hyatt lasted three albums on Geffen to critical acclaim, but again, no sales, where they cut him in 1984. By that time, Hyatt was a wreck to vodka and cocaine, and the downward spiral continued until Hyatt's wife sadly killed herself in 1985, leaving Hyatt with his infant daughter Lily. He later recounted with a still aching heart this in his song Adios to California. With the help from a lot of people in the industry, Hyatt picked himself up, got sober and got back to writing songs. Success finally came with 1987's Bring the Family, a critical smash and a 200,000 seller. His stocks rose even further when Bonnie Raitt won a Grammy for his song Thing Called Love. Thereafter, he settled into a steady rotor of usually well-received albums. He's even found a steady label, New West, a home for 20 years. 24 albums in and Hyatt is something of a quiet institution, and he seems at a kind of peace with himself. Let's take a quick stroll through his catalogue, focusing on what I think the dozen best albums are. If or when you're convinced of his greatness, you can use the buyer's guide at the end to work your way backwards. At 12, there's 2001's The Tiki Bar Is Open, where Hyatt and his usual backing band The Goners, with Kenny Blevins, Dave Ranson and the great Sonny Landreth, amongst others, deciding to rock out a little after the more sombre and reflective Crossing Muddy Water. A theme that pops up now and then is Hyatt reflecting on his sobriety both before in Everybody Went Low and after in the title track. The tunes are sharp, the band is popping and a good time is to be had by all. Next is a similarly boisterous master of disaster from the 2005, the third in Hyatt's rambunctious turn-of-the-century trilogy. This brings that trilogy to a close on a more introspective note with Hyatt in a particularly soulful voice. Backing is from the North Mississippi All-Stars. Like a lot of Hyatt's albums, its perceived flaw is that he stacks the opening half of the album with all his attention-getting songs, and it can seem to slack a little in the homeward stretches. 10 is Walk On, the kind of quiet, reflective album that efforts like The Open Road and Same Old Man would have tried to be but could not repeat. This is, I have to say, one of those albums where it's a case of what's good managing to overpower what's a little perfunctory, and be warned, there is a long and not very arresting track at the end. 
Nine is 2014's Terms of My Surrender, a darker toned album where Hyatt settles down to some of the immediate questions of his occasionally difficult existence. The title track is one of his very finest songs. It and the album were nominated for Grammys. Hyatt has 10 nominations for zero wins. Doug Lancio's guitar colours the album beautifully, and while the title track is the headliner, the whole album is a patient, unfolding story of how a man can turn from a song craftsman to a song tailor, cutting his own cloth and sewing his own suit. 8 is the sprightly, perfectly good guitar. His first top 50 album, his first overseas hit, which still saw him drop from his label. It's a much harder-edged album than the previous three, Bring the Family, Slow Turning, and Stolen Moments. And despite having the truly awful wreck of the Barbie Ferrari on it, it still comes up on the balance of things as very enjoyable. In an amusing side note, Dave Immergluck plays the electric sitar on this under the pseudonym Ravi Oli. 7. It's his If Only album, Riding with the King from 1983. It's a great set of songs, the best he'd had so far in his career, and side 1, produced by Hyatt and Scott Matthews and played entirely by them, is the final distillation of Hyatt's angry new waver persona, while side 2, produced by Nick Lowe, allows the widescreen Americana to start to creep into his work, resulting in an excellent record that's a gateway between the two careers. Of course, the what if is what if Hyatt had been in better shape to exploit the potential breakthrough, but he wasn't, and that would take time and tragedy to see happen. Six is Dirty Jeans and Mudslide Hymns from 2011, which a lot of people would have as Hyatt's best, but I just can't get over the closing track when New York had her heart broke. A 9-11 song 10 years after? <laughs> What balances that out, of course, is that Adios to California might be his very best song. Damn This Town is a crackerjack little mystery. Detroit made his equal parts proud and mournful, all the way under could be a Motown song if it were rearranged, a rather grim Motown song, but nonetheless, and Down Around My Place is a dark meditation. It's a pity he just didn't let the album end on Adios to California. At five is his latest album, Leftover Feelings. This is one album where perhaps the performances triumph a little over the songs. And while there's very good material here, Hyatt and Jerry Douglas's band are just so in sympathy with one another, it opens up whole new worlds for Hyatt here. He's easily the most country record he's made, although it isn't really country. It could be bluegrass or swamp music at any given time. It'd be really interesting to hear this band take on more of Hyatt's back catalogue. The re-recording of All the Lilacs in Ohio is a triumph. Number four finds Beneath This Gruff Exterior from 2003, which was my first hired album, and I guess that while objectively it could be a place or two lower, I have it up here for maybe in part sentimental reasons. Recorded live on the floor, it has a real rough and tumble punch to it, a sloppiness, a sense of camaraderie in the music that makes it special. That's not to say that it's just here on Heart Alone. Uncommon Connection is great. How Bad the Coffee turns a running joke into a universal complaint. My Dog and Me gets down in the swamp, and Window on the World is a quirky, odd, pop, rock and roll, swampy type, I don't know what. Missing Pieces is also one of his very finest songs. It's a good record. It won't jump up and grab you from the general Hyatt narrative, but it does want checking out. Crossing Muddy Water is at three. This is the album where Hyatt fully realised his relationship with what we'll call Americana. An all-acoustic album without a drummer, just Hyatt, Davey Farragher, and the excellent Dave Immergluck. And some quiet songs that, apart from the boisterous opener, Lincoln Town, Brood on Loss, Fear of Being Alone, and God. What Do We Do Now is a standout and one of Hyatt's very finest songs. At two, it's 1987's Bring the Family, the album that finally showed what Hyatt could really do, sober, motivated, and given sympathetic support. Roy Cooter, Nick Lowe, and Jim Keltner are the band that bring to life the most impressive set of songs Hyatt has perhaps ever assembled. While he comes so far forward on Riding with the King, his downward spiral was at its most vertiginous, making the follow-up warming up to the Ice Age. And despite some good songs, its sterile production and listless performance meant Hyatt couldn't capitalise. Here, on an album where we first see thoughtful, patient songs take the place of snappy set-piece phrases, and growing up and understanding relationships takes the place of trying to summarise them in a pithy, swing-for-the-fences soundbite, Hyatt and Band Triumph. Rai Kuda is great here. There's no grandstanding. He just fills the groove cleverly and doesn't let it spill over like Sonny Landreth may occasionally have done. By a hair's breadth, number one is Slow Turning, the follow-up to Bring the Family. Backed by the Goners, who worked with him on Tiki Bar and Gruff Exterior, the principal difference here is in the tiny degrees within each song. 
Hyatt's ability to deftly sketch characters is back in Tennessee Plates and Trudy and Dave. His wit is intact. The title track complains of the kids in the back seat banging like Charlie Watts as his wife laughs at his inability to get out of the car park. And the songs are more about the nuts and bolts that hold people together than the big themes and revelations of the previous. The music is twangier, Landreth is amazing, and the general vibe of the record is one of a man living a life from which a great burden has lifted. And there, folks, we have it. It's not often I make a video trying to sell an artist to my audience of millions, but if I can have done anything to engender any interest in an artist who deserves and rewards the kind of discriminating and intelligent fans that you all must be, then my job here is done. Until the next time we talk, stay well, be prosperous, and know that I love you all madly.